My name is Nick. I'm a senior developer at the Ontario Digital Service. And my name is Adam. I'm also a senior developer at the Ontario Digital Service. Um, and we're here to talk about decoupling Drupal and our experience with doing it at Ontario.ca. Um, feel free to raise your hands at any point in the talk. Uh, we're happy to answer questions because um, we'll be talking about a lot of stuff and maybe glossing over things that you want to know more about. Um, okay, so. Cool. So decoupling Drupal at Ontario.ca. Uh, losing our heads and getting me. Um, so I'm having a big talk here, so let's get this out of the way. There's a big vague image which has something to do with what we're talking about. There's this spider web, so you can think of spiders crawling the internet and I don't know what else, but it's there. The dewdrops in this case might represent um, decoupling Drupal. Who knows? Also, we're at Parliament Hill. There's Parliament Hill. Boom. Let's move on. Uh, so a little about our website, Ontario.ca. Uh, we're the flagship website for the Ontario government. Um, our goal is to make uh, content and services easier for people to find. So if you ever really need your driver's license sticker or try to apply for OSAP, probably visit Ontario SCA. Uh, we're currently in the progress process of migrating all 30 ministries to Ontario SCA. Uh, traditionally, they've all built their own websites with their own web teams, and we're trying to make things easier by consolidating it all to one. Um, and currently, we've migrated 15 ministries. Uh, we have six more to go, uh, and they're in progress. Cool. A um, few more statistics about Ontario.ca. Um, we are currently serving 48,000 headless pieces of content with Angular. Um, at the same time, we have 7,000 legacy Drupal nodes that we're um, making available to the public. Um, we're about to hit our 100,000th Drupal node, so that's kind of a big step for us. Just to show you, yeah. thank you. Um, this will show you how much content goes through Ontario.ca, how much of it is curated. We go through a whole lot of content. Um, we are serving 1 million sessions per week and currently we have saved the people of Ontario $4 million by partially moving to Drupal um, from vendor-based solutions and also via closing down ministry websites and housing everything on Ontario.ca. Um, also we are growing exponentially. We create 1,000 curated nodes a month. Um, so those are pages, books, FAQs, all sorts of different stuff that lives on Ontario.ca. We churn out content like crazy. Um, part of it is because we are bringing over all the ministries to Ontario.ca, and part of it is because of AODA compliance. So government websites love throwing up PDFs. PDFs are not very accessible, so we're turning them all into HTML. Um, but yeah, so I, I just found out that stat. I found it kind of amazing. Uh, so a little bit of history on Ontario CA. Uh, before coming to Drupal, we were actually at a Oracle shop, uh, to DR3. Um, that contract came to an end. It was a very long contract, and we started looking at other vendors. Uh, and there was actually a small group of us that was interested in open source, and Drupal was the best open source content management system. Uh, we had we prototyped it, and uh, at that time, Drupal 7 just came out, so we did it in Drupal 6. Um, it was a success, so we got the green light to produce the real deal. And uh, 2012, we launched Ontario.ca in Drupal 7. Um, we started to run into some performance issues on the front end, and uh, part of that was our own fault. Uh, we coded the theme correctly, uh, things like that. And, uh, started looking at other options uh, and running headless seemed like a very promising avenue to take. Uh, so in 2013 we started chopping off the front end slowly. Uh, we started serving content type by content type from Angular. Um, yeah, um, so why did we, or sorry, let's just back up and say what is headless Drupal? I think we all know, but there's a slide here for it, so it's not quite. Um, so typically, your front end is housed in Drupal, so Drupal is in charge of housing all your content and serving it to the public via the front end. Um, decouple Drupal or headless Drupal looks something like this. So there's a front end that sits on top of an API that talks to Drupal. 
Um, the front end is usually a JavaScript based. In our case, we use the NJS. Um, and uh, there's a RESTful API. And then that talks to Drupal. Um, there's also a Mongo layer in there. So, uh, why did we want to decouple? Uh, well, we want to improve scaling and security uh, by separating the contribution and user concerns. Um, so, our users visit the Angular side, our contribution team visits the Drupal side. Uh, we want to improve page load times. So, uh, we want to reduce the server load and the number of requests. We wanted to move rendering to the client side. And we wanted more efficient templating. Adam hinted at this before. Um, we sort of jumped into Drupal at uh, Drupal 7 pretty early. And if you're on, on, any, on any big projects like this, you might have developers who don't follow best practices. Big projects, those, that code just kind of remains there. It's spaghetti code. So we had pretty bad templates by some point in 2013, full of SQL queries, variables named X, weird things which uh, basically kept our UX team from wanting to use our templates and also made our templates very inefficient. Um, we wanted to embrace new technologies, so everyone started talking about uh, JavaScript-based frameworks. We didn't want to be left behind. And again, we wanted to give the UX team better control over the front end, give them a front end they're not afraid of, um, and we went with Foundation, actually. More on that later. Um, so our implementation of, of this Drupal server looks like this. We have a traditional LAMP stack. Uh, I guess mine is Apache views and events. And we have a main stack, which serves as our API. Uh, we use Elasticsearch search engine. It's JavaScript-based. It works very well with uh, uh, the main stack, the JavaScript. And we used uh, Foundation for the front end styling and uh, sort of layouts, uh, mainly because it's uh, very accessible and responsive. Um, so a little bit of a detail but under the hood of Ontario SCA. Um, so if you look up at the top, we have the normal sort of editor flow where uh, editors enter content through the node add form. Um, that's stored in the in the MySQL database, uh, nothing special there. Um, the only thing that's different is that whenever an editor saves a node or an entity, it's, uh, it goes through our shadow model, which is a custom in-house model that we developed, which basically takes a Drupal entity, converts it into JSON, and sends it to a, a RESTful API. Um, that, in turn, is served through Angular. Angular serves uh, connects to that API and does the client side rendering. Um, and because we didn't immediately jump onto the main stack, we sort of kept both speed and both waters as we transitioned, we still serve the legacy Drupal PHP pages um, for the ones we haven't migrated yet. Um, so, a little bit of our decoupling strategy. Uh, so, as Adam in that earlier, um, we leveraged the mean shadow module. Um, later on, we customized it, and then eventually Adam ended up writing his own. Um, the partial reason for that was basically PHP memory leaks and a few other things. It was very inefficient, um, especially for the amount of content that we generate. Um, we implemented a node-based REST API, um, again using MongoDB. Um, and we transitioned transition to Angular and Foundation uh, content type by content type um, uh, and following our information architecture, so our taxonomy. And the way we did this um, is we did it via Nginx uh, and PageRubber. So with every new piece of content that we moved to Angular, um, we gave it a new page alias. And then there's an Nginx rule to direct page aliases with this pattern to Angular and with a different pattern to Drupal. Cool. Um, so a little bit about our successes. It works. Yeah. That's the big one. Um, page load times are down to under a second. In fact, it was such a big turnaround from Drupal that we forgot to turn on caching. We didn't even notice. It was so good. Um, our servers and uh, our DevOps team are much happier, not having to restart HPFDM every day, do never leaks, and CPU is being pegged at 100%. Yep. Um, our UX team fools, uh, enjoys full control over front end that is modern, responsive, and accessible. Hey, how about that? 
And we have better security uh, only because uh, our front end system is completely different from our back end system. And uh, you can't do things like write SQL statements in a theme or anything like that anyway. Um, a nice fallout of this that we didn't really think about going this way was um, we have faster and easier front end development. Um, we have Angular sandboxes working. Our database at this point, I think, is like 10 gigabytes or something like that. So that's way too big for WAMP or MAMP or XAMPP or whatever to work efficiently. Um, so uh, a nice lot of this with Angular front ends, you can run Node.js locally, and you connect to our API, and you can develop locally. Lessons learned. There were a lot. Uh, Angular talent is very hard to find. Yeah. Um, some of you experienced that. Uh, the current version of Angular has only been around for about two, three years, so the most experience you find out in the developer is just that. Um, also, it's very competitive. A lot of people want Angular developers. Lots of money. Um, Angular is new, and more of its API documentation is incomplete or incorrect um, compared to Drupal. Uh, API.drupal.org is great, it gives you a lot of information. I've come across Angular documentation that is out of date that says something will not work and it does work, or something won't, or the opposite around, something will work and it won't work. Which version of Angular are you on? Are you on? We are currently on 1.5, but we're going to be moving to something else pretty soon. Two or something else completely? Uh, that's not officially decided yet. If we do, we'll move to Angular. It's just called Angular, but I guess it's four now. Um, or view or react. Um, we have to make some business decisions and uh, depending on what kind of developers we hire. <laughs> yeah. um, we may have done this a bit too early. Uh, we jumped on this in 2013, so at that time it was just Angular version 1 and Drupal 7. Uh, if we did this today with Drupal 8 being an API first content management system and a newer version of Angular being completely rewritten, uh, things would be a lot easier. Uh, architecture would be a lot more Um An interesting follow-up that wasn't thought of when we went to this is uh, we lost certain features that were we didn't even think of, like in-page editing. You know that edit tab that appears on the node? What a lovely thing. It's gone if you build a uh, front-end architecture on top of it. Um, you lose preview as well. So we had to create more complicated contributor workflows. Adam had had to write several new modules to allow people to preview content and to share content. Um, so, interesting thing that fell out there. And it's uh, difficult to manage the two different stacks as we transition. Yeah, um, another interesting thing that came out of this is uh, we realized that uh, the data layer or the data model became pretty abstracted. Um, if you're working in Drupal, and you're developing in Drupal, it's pretty obvious that field, what a field might do or how a field might, um, uh, you know, or the functionality of a field that is intended for a field or how it works in another field. Once that goes through um, an API and once that ends up on an Angular developer's desk, he may know nothing about this. And so then he's back at square one and he's building something and you're like, why are you building it this way? And he's like, I don't know. So, interesting thing that came out of there. And we experienced a lot of repetition of business logic, uh, both in Drupal and the main stack, and then sometimes again in Angular. Yeah, uh, another interesting thing is that we have one form on Ontario.ca currently. It is a contact form. And to get that form to work properly with our Drupal stack is a little complicated. If your site has a lot of forms, or if you require information to go both ways, I would seriously have concerns about chopping off the front end. So, should you decouple? Yes. Uh, so, Trace posted a, on his blog a chart that might help you uh, decide if you want to go ahead this or not. Um, basically, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to give up everything here in, in this big box? And uh, if you're not willing to give it up, are you prepared to build it out yourself? And if the answer is still no, then perhaps staying in couple might be a better avenue, or at least quicker. Um, yeah, so that's stuff like previewing, editing, all these things. There actually was an article posted by Nullabot like two days ago, which talks about a lot of this stuff, like what you'll lose if you decouple, and are you ready to build it out yourself? 
Um, we have a few next steps for Ontario Nets that we want to share with you. Um, we're going to upgrade the Drupal 8. Uh, Drupal 8 uh, puts the API first, or you can put the API first a lot easier. Um, doing Drupal 8 is going to be awesome. Um, it's me or you? It's you. I don't know. Okay, cool. okay. Cool. Um, we're going to really evaluate the need for a shadow module. Um, again, we're like, uh, with the services API, you can expose endpoints and create JSON output very easily. Um, we may not actually need a, a shadow module that Adam spent a very long time building. I'm the biggest advocate of getting rid of it. <laughs> um, we're going to upgrade uh, the front end to Angular for maybe Vue, maybe React. Um, we're going to possibly leverage the reservoir distribution. I'm not sure if you guys know about this, but it's a, it's a particular Git repo um, that has a whole bunch of modules. Uh, that are meant for decoupled Drupal, already bundled into it, and has the theming layer chopped off. So it seems like a really great place to start with headless Drupal. Um, we're going to leverage Drupal VM a whole lot more. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone here has played with this, uh, but it's really, really awesome. And again, a great way to not have to bother with WAMP, XAMPP. Which one am I forgetting? MAMP, all those things. Um, and microservices. We're going to expand uh, on microservices quite significantly. Do you want to say something about this? Uh, no. Know. All right. Um, all right. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, there's one right there. How did you guys handle SEO since, like, it was a client side rendered? Like, how could Google index your pages? Okay. So this is really awesome. This is something that we lost again yeah. without thinking about it. Um, so uh, we used the meta tags module in Drupal. Um, so that worked to create great meta tags for Drupal in Drupal. We had to rewrite this. We had to add this to the shadow module. So all our meta tags then got shadowed. And then we basically rebuilt meta tags in Angular. Like we had to build a whole service around it. Yeah. So if you look at Ontario.ca in the store in the console, you'll see these things called Angular meta tags. They're mapped to each other. It was a whole thing. Um, on top of that, because it, it was a JavaScript framework, um, we had to write special rules for the bots to be redirected to our contrib interface. Anyway, it's a whole, whole thing that we lost without even thinking about it. Along the same lines, though, with the JavaScript totally front end uh, and having to be accessible to your government, yep. did you have to do server side rendering for any clients, or was there zero complaints? Uh, I don't have any complaints for being JavaScript only. No, no, no screen readers are pretty smart right now. Um, no problem whatsoever with JavaScript as long as it's not doing dumb things. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't attend the talk earlier about Java. Don't blame JavaScript for accessibility goals, but maybe they talked about this a little bit. Um, we have a pretty great UX team, and so it was really they did a really great job of making sure that they were pretty accessible. Um, from another talk today, I did run the audit on one of our pages, and we had a 92% score on accessibility, so I think that's pretty good. So, so that's interesting, because the, the answer to SEO sometimes is do server-side rendering, so you can actually just parse your page. Yeah. And the answer to accessibility sometimes is just produce it on the server-side, so nobody asks you, there's no request on you to say, uh, my client device can't support JavaScript, or I refuse to support JavaScript. Give me a text version. Uh, no, that, that hasn't come across actually. I, I'm a developer. Maybe that maybe someone said that to the UX team. But our managers got mm -hmm. that. And you're sure. But that, that, <laughs> that proves the presentation from this morning that JavaScript is not a barrier. It's, it's not a barrier. It's not a barrier. As long as it, as long as it's on the slide. Yeah, we, I know we spent a lot of time, again, like, um, and this might be like an Ajax thing, again, if you refresh certain pages, you have to put the focus on that page. Um, so there's special tags that do that, that, you know, it's like the, what's the main part of your page. Um, that's challenging sometimes, but, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, would it be a good idea to uh, design the, which pages gets uh, true true world directly and which pages are using, uh, uh, are using uh, Angular. Angular, because uh, maybe some pages are complicated, like the forms, and the others, maybe uh, you want to use Angular because uh, there's a lot of traffic on those pages. Uh, 
Um, so our plan currently is just to migrate everything to Angular. Uh, the reason why we have some still in Drupal is we just haven't gotten to migrating those yet. But the, to your point, um, some of the more complicated pages we haven't had a chance to migrate yet. For example, we're having a few issues with Google Maps um, because it's asynchronous and sometimes it'll load faster. And, and with content on Terry.ca, some of it's been there for since 2012 when we started uh, with Drupal 7. Um, so the funny thing is that those contents, depending on when they were created, use a different version of Google Maps that require different parameters to be passed. And it's it's pretty complicated. So yeah, so those actually are Google Maps. A lot of our Google Maps pages are served by Drupal for that reason. Um, and the only other piece of content that we make sure is served by Drupal is web forms. Um, again, because there's the two-way binding there necessary. Um, you know, web forms are great in Drupal. You want to create a radio button, you just say radio button and it draws it. Are you ready to redo that for every kind of web form element you have in Angular? We actually had a developer get pretty far down it, that, down that rabbit hole, but then he left. <laughs> so, so maybe that was the thing that, that broke the canvas back. Yep. What does your server stack look like? Is it not a single thread, right? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, what was the question? Was so like, are you running multiple node instances, or how are you load balancing? Uh, I believe we have uh, two EC2 instances running node. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they auto scale as well, so uh, okay. these are we get a lot of traffic, it scales horizontally. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering about your choice of uh, Drupal V versus the uh, number from Drupal. Not after Drupal 5, I think it's one. So uh, we're actually using both at the moment. Okay. Uh, we do use we officially use Docker as uh, our sandbox environment. So we have uh, a Docker stack that has mean, Elasticsearch, Drupal, everything in there all ready to go. And uh, Drupal VM is something that we're experimenting with for Drupal 8. Yeah, we found that um, with the Docker stack, we are relying a lot on our DevOps environment. Um, they're the ones that maintain our sandboxes, and you know, there's a huge database that goes with it. There's all these stacks that go with it. So we wanted to give DevOps a bit of a break, especially for starting up projects. And Drupal VM is just really a really great way. Like it's command line and Vagrant. You know, you just run it, and you have a Drupal environment where you can, you know, hit the ground running. Yes. So uh, why did you pick Angular and not some of the other JavaScript frameworks like Ember? Um, so at the time of it was uh, 2013, so a lot of the frameworks weren't around yet. Uh, mainly it was uh, Angular and React, and uh, it came down mainly due to the licensing models with uh, the other uh, front-end frameworks, and Angular had a better open source uh, licensing model. Yeah, also it's supported by Google, so we were just like, yeah. yeah, so we were just betting on Google, I think, a little bit. Yeah, but we weren't <laughs> entirely sure. We weren't super committed to it. We, we just thought, okay, this is, there's a lot of JavaScript frameworks coming up, and uh, this one looks like it's taking off. Yeah, and even now, there's a lot of comparisons of the frameworks. Like, there was one that said, like, you know, 90% of Vue users are really happy using Vue, and 50% of Angular users are happy using Angular. And that has some weight to it, but Angular is still, I think, like more robust in terms of modularity than Vue is. Um, but we have to evaluate all that. Like, this is our 2.0 version of our say is going to be crazy getting. We just got to figure out what we're <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, so before we leave you, we just want to introduce you to the Ontario Digital Service. Um, the ODS is a new government service that will work with ministries, agencies, and external partners to develop a digital government action plan. That's the official verbiage they use. Um, as part of the ODS, we have a new chief digital officer in Ontario. Her name is Hillary Hartley. You may have heard her on the radio or seen her on TV. Uh, there's a big publicity campaign behind that. She is going to be, quote unquote, our ship umbrella help us get stuff done <laughs> to get stuff done at Ontario and not let the bureaucracy get in the way. Um, more on that in a sec. 
Um, the ODS is going to be modeled after gov.uk ATF, which is uh, US equivalent of gov.uk. Um, and literally, we're going to be modeled after them because we are working with people from gov.uk and ATF. Hillary Hurley is from ATF. Um, if you remember the keynote this morning um, from the federal government, you know they mentioned that they're desperately trying to catch up on the digital divide. Um, they're talking about agile open source, um, and they're desperate to get there. We are there at this point. Um, the ODS, I, for example, am actually working on an alpha project for the Ontario government. Um, partially, that's because of the people I'm working with had two million of dollars, two million dollars of funding pulled away from them. But I think they're also coming around to this idea of alphas and betas not delivering a huge monolithic vendor-driven solution at the end. Um, Adam is working agile, he's building microservices. So AAA installations, little pieces coming together. Um, agile, open source, Ontario government is already there. And so on that note... Uh, so we're looking for people. <laughs> uh, do you like anything you see? Technologies or processes, uh, we're hiring um, a number of benefits. So uh, if you're interested, get in touch with either Nick or myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, oh, yeah. What's this? Terry Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and if you like Nerf Gun Wars, that's great. If you don't, that's also great. If I don't like them, I like to hide when they go on. But yeah, go to Ontario.ca slash digital jobs and sign up for job alerts. Um, current room around the office is we're 30 positions short of where we should be. Um, but that's partially because the jobs haven't been posted. The jobs are going to be posted shortly. Come join us. It's really fun. Thanks.